Good morning. My name is Joshua Freed, and today I'd like to talk to you about a kilobit hidden SNFS discrete logarithm computation that I worked on this past year, along with Piri Godry, Nadia Henninger, and Emmanuel Tome. So to start, a brief review again of finite field to Thielman key exchange, which you've all seen before. Uh, your usual cast of characters, you have Alice and Bob that want to compute some uh, shared secret in a public channel. Uh, so they use a publicly agreed upon pair of parameters, a prime P and G, a generator of some subgroup of P for their computations. They compute their public values modulo P um, and separately can both derive the same secret. Now what I actually want to focus on uh, here uh, are the prime P and G, that, uh, the prime P and the generator G that they pick, um, and where those actually come from in practice. Um, so today, it really depends on the protocol. Um, in, in several cases, uh, protocol specifications and RFCs actually name a set of primes uh, that implementations should use for Diffie-Hellman. So in TLS version 1.3, um, IPsec or Ike, which is used for VPNs, um, and SSH also uses a few of these uh, standardized primes. In other cases, they're actually distributed in the implementations when the protocol leaves it up to the uh, implementation. The Apache web server distributes some primes for TLS uh, versions before 1.3. OpenSSH distributes primes, and, and the Java JDK also includes just a bunch of fixed primes that users of its crypto library uh, can use. And then finally, some users actually generate their own primes, um, which is possible to do in SSH and TLS versions prior to 1.3, but this isn't actually done that often in practice. It's usually a small fraction of users that choose to go this route. Um, and we see, for example, with TLS, with web hosts, about 80% of um, web hosts that are using finite field Diffie-Hellman are actually using just one of 10 common primes. So today I'd like to talk about the possibility of backdooring these common primes, given that they're uh, so standardized. If, if you are picking the prime and, and baking it into your standard or your software implementation, what sort of advan advantage can you give yourself for computing discrete logarithms with this prime? Um, so what, what would backdooring a prime look like? Um, would it be detectable if you were to do it? Um, what sort of computation would be required if you're the attacker um, and you backdoor a prime? And what the impact of the results of the, the answers to these questions are for um, currently deployed cryptography? So a brief review of the number field sieve. Uh, you just heard the previous talk about that. But to review, there's the first stage of polynomial selection. You pick a good pair of polynomials that share a root modulo of the prime you're targeting. You collect relations by sieving the polynomials and collecting results that factor completely below some bound that you choose. You perform linear algebra um, to solve for the discrete logs of the elements in your, uh, in your base. And then finally, given some specific instance of the problem, um, a target, say Alice is g to the a or Bob's g to the b, uh, you try and write that target as the sum of the logs um, that you have uh, from your computation. So how long does it take to actually run this algorithm? Well, uh, the first answer is using uh, the usual L notation. The asymptotic complexity is L of one third with the coefficient of 1.923. Um, it's actually important to note that this figure comes from the, the mostly from the pre-computation stage, um, and that when you're actually given an individual instance, of, once you've completed that stage and you're given an individual instance of the problem to solve, like g to the a or g to the b, the coefficient actually drops in, in the L notation to 1.232. Um, so what does this look like in practice? Um, with a 512-bit uh, prime number, um, it might take about 10 core years of pre-computation to run the number field sieve and only about 10 minutes to compute the discrete logarithm of an individual target. Um, as you heard in Thorsten's talk previously, uh, for a 768-bit prime, it might take about 5,000 uh, core years for the first stage and then an average of two days uh, to compute an individual log in the second stage. And finally, for a kilobit sized prime, we estimate maybe it would take about 10 million core years uh, to run the number field sieve and then about a month to actually do the second stage. So jumping back to the first stage of the, of the number field sieve, uh, which is polynomial selection, the goal of polynomial selection is to pick a pair of polynomials that share some common root modulo, the prime that you're targeting. Um, so a kind of easy way to do this, an algorithm that, that will certainly produce that pair of polynomials, which could be usable for the number field sieve, um, is as follows. You could pick some M that's roughly around the size of sixth root of P, the, the size of uh, that number. You can write P in base M and then just take the coefficients um, from that expansion and use them for your first polynomial. For your second polynomial, you can just write X minus M. And it's clear to see that when evaluated M, both of these are going to be zero mod P. Um, using a construction like this or similar constructions, 
uh, we expect the size of the, the, co the coefficients are going to be about the size of the sixth of p, or the sixth root of p. Um, and this actually has an important impact on the sieving stage, uh, namely when, when you have smaller coefficients on your polynomials, um, the resulting norms when you sieve are going to uh, be smaller and they actually have a higher probability of, of factoring completely below the bound that you're targeting. Which leads us to the case of the special number field sieve, which actually historically preceded the general number field sieve. Um, and it, it was observed that for some, some numbers that could be expressed um, with a pair of polynomials that had really small coefficients, um, the number field sieve was actually much more efficient. Um, so for example, with Mersenne numbers, uh, or, or numbers that are close to powers of two, um, and some other uh, numbers similar to these, it's very easy to find a pair of polynomials with small coefficients um, that share a root mod modulo of those numbers. And the impact um, for, for running the number field sieve on asymptotic complexity is fairly large. Uh, the coefficient in the L notation drops from 1.923 to 1.526. Um, and in real terms, in, um, a discrete logarithm computation for a 768-bit special number field sieve applicable prime only takes about 60 core years in comparison to 5,000. Um, and in the, in the uh, kilobit case, it only takes about 400 core years to run the number field sieve um, as opposed to an estimated 10 million core years. So if we take a, a brief uh, trip back to the 1990s, um, in 91, NIST was proposing standardizing digital signature algorithm. Um, which was the f one of the first like standardized schemes that, that relied on the discrete logarithm problem. They were considering using primes of 512-bit size and 160-bit uh, prime order subgroups. And it was observed that a trapdoor could, uh, could theoretically be constructed, or you could pick some prime that would be amenable to the special number field sieve, but it would be somewhat hidden or uh, not clear, um, meaning it wouldn't be of the form you know, 2 to the n minus 1 or something close to a power of 2, which would be obvious, but some other kind of number that would not be clear. So how would you possibly do this? Um, so Daniel Gordon in 1992 wrote a paper about trapdooring DSA primes. Um, a kind of easy way to, to start off doing this would just be pick some random pair of polynomials, f and g, um, where you're uh, with small coefficients, um, check if they uh, share a common root that is a prime, and then if they do, see if that prime has, has a um, has a subgroup of your desired order. Um, then uh, Daniel Gordon actually proposed a improved algorithm in this paper where you could actually define your problem in terms of some polynomial f which you pick in advance that has small coefficients. You pick the order of your subgroup q um, and you try some random um, coefficient g0 and then see if you can solve for a g1 so that such that um, the resultant of your polynomials is prime and you'll have the property that p minus one is divisible by q. Um, so it's actually a uh, fairly simple algorithm for coming up with such a trapdoor prime. So how would, would one of these uh, would one of these primes generated this way be detectable? Um, the answer is yes, it would be certainly detectable if um, your linear polynomial was monic or if the coefficient in front of the x was a one, uh, because the resulting prime would actually th the upper bits of the resulting prime would be uh, direct product of the a direct result of the um, the coefficient g0 and the leading small uh, coefficients in f. So you could, since f has small coefficients, you could brute force over all the values, uh, possible values for the leading coefficient of f and see if you can solve for a g0. Um, however, if, uh, if the polynomial is not monic and there's some large-ish g1 uh, uh, used to construct this, then there's actually no known way to uncover this trapdoor um, and, and stating it sort of in a different way, if you're given some prime, it's hard to find a pair of polynomials um, with small coefficients um, if there exists such a polynomial, a pair of polynomials. So in 1992, they were considering using 512-bit uh, primes with 160-bit uh, prime order subgroups, and actually trying to construct a trapdoor prime with these properties uh, was, was considered to be difficult or impossible, and you're basically either forced to choose um, a trapdoor that gave you a polynomial that was not optimal for running the number field sieve, namely the polynomial, the degree of the polynomial would have to, the degree of one of the polynomials would have to be three, um, when in principle you really want a degree five polynomial, or if you picked a larger degree polynomial, the coefficients would have to be so small such that it would be um, easy to brute force over the polynomials or enumerate all possible combinations of polynomials, or all possible polynomials for one of the polynomials, excuse me. Um, 
And this led them at the time to, to believe, and there was a big uh, panel discussion at Eurocrypt in 1992 about this uh, topic, that the trap wouldn't really be feasible for, for these types of crimes, or if you were to trapdoor them, it would be detectable. Um, and as such, when the, when the DSA was standardized, um, they noted that perhaps picking the prime should be done in some verifiably random way. Um, they gave a procedure for doing that, but they sort of marked um, a proof of, th of this as, as, an optional, um, as an optional field. So you could, you could generate your primes verifiably random, but you wouldn't have to, just randomly, but you wouldn't have to. How about today? So today people are using DSA primes um, that, uh, with 1024 bits that have 160-bit order subgroups. And this is actually optimal for Gordon's construction. This allows you to choose a polynomial with uh, degree six, which is good for the number field sieve, and also allows you to choose large enough coefficients um, for your polynomial f, such that actually enumerating all possible um, polynomials would be very expensive or uh, equivalent to the cost of running poly row um, for the suborder, for the subgroup q. Um, so it's certainly uh, possible to construct such a prime um, using using the same algorithm that Gordon uh, published in 1992. Um, so next, what we want to show is that it, it would actually be possible to exploit a prime uh, that was constructed this way. Um, so we generated one of these primes uh, using a small script that implemented Gordon's algorithm. Um, it printed out this pretty random looking prime. Um, it's random if you look at it like this or in hex and a 160-bit uh, prime order subgroup. You can see the polynomial pair that shares the root modulo of this prime. Um, and you can observe that in the F polynomial, the coefficients are really small. Um, so the special number field sieve applies. So we went ahead and ran the uh, number field sieve for this prime, and you can see that it took uh, a fairly low amount of time. It took about two months of calendar time split across two clusters, one uh, at UPenn and one in INRIA in Nancy. Um, we used on average about 2,000 cores for most of the computation. Um, the sieving took about one month, the linear algebra took about one month, and uh, we'll note that the linear algebra was faster because we were able to do it modulo or 160-bit Q instead of uh, if we had picked a safe prime. Um, it's also worth noting that the solution step is fairly, uh, fairly quick uh, in, our, in our case because we used a, a neat trick due to Horner um, to speed that up and have that take a significantly less, uh, a smaller chunk of time. Uh, we also know the individual log, actually computing a log given a target, we tried to speed it up significantly by throwing a lot of cores at it, and we got it down to about an hour and, and 20 minutes um, across some subset of our cluster. Uh, so all in all, actually computing, coming up with one of these primes and computing the discrete logarithm for it is very much in range um, for attackers with pretty modest resources. Um, in case you're wondering what 2,000 cores actually looks like, uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, not too many racks, not too many servers. Um, so how about today? Are there actual primes uh, being used in the wild that are amenable to SNFS? Uh, the answer is yes, there are some primes that are being used that are not hidden at all, um, namely these primes that are close to powers of two. Um, we have a 512-bit prime and a 1024-bit prime, which we discovered when using internet scanning of publicly visible uh, services. Um, there are about 120, 130 hosts that are still using these primes today. Uh, this is a, as of last week, I believe. Um, for the 512-bit prime, running the number field sieve actually takes just over three hours. Um, we ran the special number field sieve computation for the 784-bit prime also, uh, which was discovered and in, uh, baked into a crypto library. Um, that took about 23 days on our cluster, and then we did not run the, the special number field sieve for the 1024-bit prime that we discovered. We estimated it would have been um, maybe three or four times harder than the one that uh, we ran, because it's a safe prime. How about poorly hidden primes? So primes that have this property where there, there does exist some pair of polynomials um, where there's a small where the coefficient for the linear polynomial uh, the, the where the linear polynomial is monic. So we did it, we took collected all the primes that we could find from various scans of, of internet hosts, and we brute forced potential leading coefficients of a degree f polynomial um, for degrees, po uh, for polynomials of degrees two through nine with uh, up to uh, possi possible 10-bit uh, uh, leading coefficients. We didn't find any polynomials, uh, we didn't find any primes that had 
um, these special number fields to the holiday mills. So how about the remaining crimes that are seen today in use? Um, some of them are verifiably random. Um, so the, in the primes that are published in the Java JDK uh, are actually published with the seeds um, to show that they're how they're generated using the generated using NIST's um, ESA verify like prime generation algorithm. Some numbers are are nothing up my sleeve numbers that are derived from um, digits of pi or e. Um, we sort of trust that these numbers are not backdoored because they seem to have arrived at them in, in a fairly random way. And finally, there are a bunch of uh, numbers that are sort of floating around or in use that we're for which we actually have no record of how they were generated. Um, some of these are actually pretty commonly used. Um, some examples include the groups that are baked into the Apache web server. Um, there's no published record of how the, those were picked. Um, and also groups that were standardized in an RFC 5114 have uh, no record of exactly how they were generated. Um, if you take a look at RFC 5114, the first group that it defines is a 1024 bit group with 160-bit prime order subgroup. It's in use by about 900,000 web servers uh, today, that, uh, which constitutes about 2.3% of, uh, of web servers using HTTPS, or about 10% of web servers using finite field Diffie-Hellman. And these primes are also being used for IPsec or VPN servers. Uh, about 13% support these groups. And again, these groups are, have been published uh, in this document, but there's no uh, record of how they were actually generated um, or no proof of verifiable randomness. Um, the document actually says they drew them from NIST test data that was published. Um, when we released the ePrint of, of the paper, when we released the paper on ePrint, um, there was a bunch of discussion on the ITF mailing list. Tim Polk from NIST basically said, these probably came from NIST, but we have no idea how we generated them. We have no record. Um, it would probably be a good idea to deprecate them, given that we uh, can't really trust them. Um, so what about 2048 bits? Um, Gordon's trapdoor construction would still work using modern parameters. So uh, primes that are used today for, uh, DSA primes that are used today of 2048 bits usually have a 224 bit or 256 bit um, subgroup, um, which allows us to pick a polynomial of degree seven, which is good for the number field sieve and use Gordon's algorithm. However, actually running the special number field sieve, uh, even for, for a trapdoor number, or running the special number field sieve would still probably take about seven billion core years. Um, and in contrast to our 400 core years for the kilobit SNFS, it's probably not really feasible, but it's certainly not really giving you 2048 bit strength that you might expect otherwise if it's, if it's trapdoored. So considerations for the future, takeaways. Uh, it's always good when you're designing crypto um, algorithms and protocols to try and eliminate the potential for backdoored parameters. Uh, we saw with dual EC, even if it was never actually backdoored by anyone who standardized it, it's actually been um, weaponized or used in, in the real world. Uh, the backdoor has been exploited. Um, it's important if you need verifiable randomness um, in your parameters to really stress that and not allow it to end up getting marked as optional, even if something doesn't seem immediately feasible. Um, and of course, um, it's good to account for pre-computation in your analysis. If everyone is using the same set of primes, then the cost of actually backdooring or running the number field sift for one of these primes is amortized um, because it gets you many, uh, allows you to break many instances of the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua, for that very interesting talk. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah. Is there any evidence to suggest that Gordon's algorithm is optimal for embedding these trapdoors? Um, well, no, no one has come up with a way of uncovering them yet. Uh, so it seems somewhat optimal, but there may be better ways. I mean, you can basically, you can create these trapdoors also by just randomly picking a pair of polynomials and seeing if it satisfies your criteria. Um, but I'm not sure. Any other questions? So uh, have you thought about uh, if there's an algorithm to detect whether um, uh, kind of a prime is trapdoored uh, without uh, spilling out the coefficients? Um, 
some of my co-authors uh, did spend a considerable amount of time trying to go through possible ways of uncovering the trapdoors and weren't able to come up with anything. It's sort of an open problem. We don't have a proof that it's not uncoverable or that it is uncoverable. We don't so have you don't have don't a proof whether these two problems are separated or something like that. We, we don't have a proof that, that this is completely undetectable. It could be that someone in the future comes up with some algorithm for detecting this, but as of today, there's no known way of detecting it. Mm, I guess my question is like, uh, so maybe you can detect, uh, but uh, cannot uh, spell out the exact F and the G. You know, is that a possibility to do that maybe faster? I'm not sure. Okay, thanks.